Okay, I think we're all seated. Except me and some of Hi, thanks for uh, coming out tonight. Uh, as I mentioned to you outside, uh, we had uh, a meeting scheduled at 7, which we have to get to at some point tonight. So this is not part of that meeting. This is kind of an informal. We'll hear uh, what you have to say. Uh, but I think what we need to do uh, is um, just hear a little bit about um, what can or cannot be done within the framework of the Local Government Act and the Community Charter. Uh, as many of you know, we have uh, we don't have complete authority to do whatever we want as a municipality. In fact, I I read this morning about this. Uh, uh, this uh, East Dorset district from the UK uh, thing that went in my door, and, and some of those things are great, um, but uh, we have certain limitations here under the what used to be called the Municipal Act, now the so Local Government Act. So I thought before we kind of uh, maybe uh, heard from some of you, if you want to uh, share some of your feelings and thoughts, we're, we'll start with uh, with getting our staff to tell you. A little bit about uh, uh, the, the structure of our of our bylaws uh, and uh, how we can or cannot control uh, architecture. We'll hear a little bit about the difference between our bylaws here, for instance, and the very special bylaws that we have up in the uplands, uh, which are very unusual, not just for Oak Bay but right throughout British Columbia. Uh, we have something called the special Oak Bay Special Powers Act uh, that pertains to only to the uplands. Uh, so uh, where we can control certain things there, which we're not allowed legally to control other places. So, um, and then we can, uh, if anyone wants to come forward and, and uh, share some thoughts with us and have some questions of our staff, uh, we can do that. And just remember, we've got to get to the other agenda. Got to get to that tonight. It's a very important agenda. That's the uh, essentially we're going to be launching the OCP uh, process. So, questions about the uh, what we're going to do tonight? Too? Okay. Again, thanks for coming. Roy, did you want to start off? You want to mark? Uh, well, um, essentially, in terms of design control, uh, the Local Government Act uh, doesn't allow single-family dwelling. Can you speak up a bit? I'm sorry, it's a little difficult here. Yep, we, can, we do have hope. We'll just, let's just pull that one. Yeah. Yeah, just move that to the corner there, Steve. Thanks. So under the Local Government Act, the uh, development permit areas is uh, not used for residential neighborhoods. It is generally for multi- family residential commercial properties where and similar like the Oak Bay Avenue where you actually have some uh, design controls for a development permit but it, that, the local government act doesn't allow you to do it for single family dwellings. Um, one area that might be able to be used and that will be something for the OCP to consider it might be heritage conservation areas in different areas of the municipality where there could be some controls, additional, it would be an additional requirement for development essentially uh, under a heritage conservation area where uh, council could have some uh, approval process in it. Um, but we don't have any heritage conservation areas currently in our OCP. Um, but I'm hoping that in, with the new OCP coming that that would be something that uh, council is considering. Um, well, maybe you can you can start also by talking about what we can control, what what we are allowed to do with our bylaws in terms of controlling uh, uh, single family dwellings, because that's really what we're talking about here. Well, we're allowed to uh, have a zoning bylaw, and in that zoning bylaw, we have different residential zones with different parameters that are permitted, uh, so we can uh, limit lot coverage. Uh, and we do that, uh, which is 25% for all residential properties in Oak Bay. So that's, a, that's the footprint. That's the footprint of the building, building, essentially. 25% for the maximum building? Hang on. Yeah. For the principal start. building, yes. 25% yeah. is maximum that you can have a lot coverage. So your house cannot be bigger than 25% of the lot. Oh, well, okay. Well, there's other restrictions too, but we you can also have an accessory building, right? Yes, yeah, so an accessory building also has uh, 
uh, in our bylaw, it's uh, varied actually 7% to a maximum of 473 square feet uh, or 5% uh, of the lot, whichever is less. So it, it's a kind of a different way of looking at accessory buildings. Uh, the other now, first of, of all, can that 25% of the footprint be changed? In other words, can they, people come to council and ask for anything bigger than that? Yeah, no, that can't be varied. 25% is a uh, density, so that, that's not allowed to be varied. So what about the, uh, the floor, uh, floor space in the house? Yeah, the floor space in the house, uh, right now, we have, in our five zones, we have three zones that are based on a floor area ratio, and that's uh, basically the total floor area uh, per, per lot size. So uh, it's right now at 0 0.40, which is 40% of the lot. Uh, so if you have a thousand square meter lot, you could have 400 square meters of floor area in the building to a maximum 25% coverage also. So, you, you know, th there's two controls there. In our other two zones, RS4 and RS5, which uh, 1058 Monterey falls into RS5. We don't use the floor area ratio. Uh, it was changed a few years ago to a gross floor area permitted. And that's, uh, there's two, two calculations, one including the basement and one for just the top, top uh, floors. And uh, there's also two sizes. So in the RS5 zone, <coughs> the property that you're here about, uh, it's allowed to uh, after 750 mm -hmm. square meters in size of lot, the, that square footage also increases in uh, in value. So that particular lot is allowed 300 square meters or 3,229 square feet of floor area for that dwelling. And they are at 3,228 square feet. So that's how tight they're building it. And they're at 24.7% lot coverage. So they are building right to the maximum of what our bylaw permits. Now, what happens if people wanted to change the floor space of a house? Are they allowed to do that? In the RS4 and RS5, uh, they could do a development variance permit through council uh, to vary the square footage of the house. If council does think it's appropriate, then they could approve that variance for an additional floor area. And this case has been asked for? No, it hasn't. So there's no variances involved in this uh, house. Okay, there, was a, there was a question about height, uh, maximum height. Uh, you can also maybe talk about maximum setbacks from the, uh, the perimeter of the house. Yeah. So or the lot, I should say. So in that, uh, there's three heights that we have. We have an occupiable height, which is the highest occupiable floor. Uh, and we also have a building height, which is usually uh, the highest wall or possibly a highest parapet, depending on the building design. And there's also a uh, roof height, which is the peak of the roof. So those three heights. And this one, the building height really governs it because it's a flat roof design, essentially, uh, for most of it, I believe. Can that be varied? Can those heights be varied? They could be varied, but they're not being asked to vary those heights here. They are compliant to the bylaw. Okay. And what about the distance to the lot lines? Well, what rules do we have there, and have there been any changes in, the, in this particular property? So the setbacks uh, are 5 feet and 10 feet on the side lot lines. And um, with the five and 10 feet, so they can have either side five or 10 feet. In this particular case, they had, um, I believe five feet on the lane side originally, and they moved it to 10 feet because they didn't want to redesign their entry uh, <coughs> stairwell essentially, which is a two story uh, uh, projection to, on that side of the uh, property. Uh, <coughs> the second story setback is required to be 10 feet also, and that's one reason why they moved the building to the south, uh, an additional four feet plus. Now, <coughs> moving the building, uh, in this case, didn't uh, change the fact that the western red cedar, which was a protected tree, 
was going to be damaged beyond uh, because it has surface roots. The municipal arborist went out and he said that it would be damaged uh, uh, with the construction of a new house. And his recommendation was to remove it. And we have a bond which is required under the tree bylaw. And uh, two replacement trees would happen. The two birch trees that went, uh, I was under the understanding that they were going to have an arborist look at one birch tree to try and keep it, but I saw today that they just took it out also, so they took both birch trees out. But those weren't protected uh, trees under our bylaw. Now, just to get back to make one more point in terms of design and architecture, uh, the materials, the shape of the house, uh, other than height and but how it looks. Can we control that in that zone? Yeah, we don't have any controls of what, what, what the house looks like. Okay. Now, if this house were to be built in the uplands, would we have controls? Yes. And why is that? That's because the upland, uh, Uplands uh, Special, Special Powers Act, which created the Uplands Bylaw, which allows council to uh, have control over siting and architectural design. Excuse me, that's legal? Yeah, yes. it's, uh, it's created, it's, yeah. the, it's a special uh, act of the legislature, uh, which was passed and designed just for the uplands. Uh, could Old Bay not apply for something like that? Um, it was barely went through the legislature as it, as it was in those days, and uh, no, I, I, don't, I have not known of any community that uh, has that special power. What do you need? There's no appetite to try. Um, Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Yes. <laughs> no, it's just, uh, no it, it's just not, it's not feasible. It really isn't. No. Because if, uh, if, if they were then to create a special power for us, they would have to do it for the whole of the province, Good. not just there. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was reluctance, and I can't, I can't remember when it was passed, in the late 30s, something like that. 35. I did 35. Yeah, there was real reluctance to do it now, because I read the history books, because they didn't want to set a precedent for other communities to ask for the same thing. And the, uh, the reason, uh, as I understand it, why it was done for the uplands is because there was uh, mutual, mutual covenants on each other's property in terms of the nature of that, that was that was put in when it was subdivided. Uh, so. Uh, so that's that's just uh, under our circumstances to change the local government act to, to allow that uh, the uh, the province would never do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, what else do we have? Is there Are there else questions being entertained? Yep. I just a minute. I just want to. No, I, I think uh, Ms. Thomas has uh, adequately covered off okay. the legislative framework. So will you repeat that? I, I can't hear. I'm it. just saying that Mr. Thomason has quite adequately covered off the legislative um, aspects of this, so I, I have nothing to add at this point. All right, so um, we're going to ask you to come forward, might be the easiest, and you know, a couple of you at a, at a time. Uh, have a seat if you have any questions. Um, keeping in mind what uh, our role here uh, is in this community. And if you could just, uh, so we know where you're, where you are, uh, where you live, and your name. We're not taking this question minutes to this, just so we know who we are. Mayor, hello. Uh, my name is Eric Zonka. I live on McNeil Avenue uh, near Monterey. And my question is for the, um, uh, uh, Mr. Thompson. A question in particular about how much discretion the building uh, department has with respect to the uh, uh, building permit issue. Uh, internal um, uh, atriums and internal vaulted ceilings. I understand there's an interpretation that can be done with respect to gross floor area and size of building. Um, now, without legislative change, I understand uh, some discretion can be applied or cannot be applied within the department. And in the case of this particular um, uh, property that some of us are quite concerned about, how much uh, discretion was applied to this building in terms of its gross size? Well, think? the gross size, there was no discretion. I mean, it met the bylaw, so there was no interpretation of the floor area in, in that regard. So it's basically but at the maximum? It's at the maximum. Uh, there was some discussion about the two-story tower, stair tower kind of thing that was on the lane side there as to whether that two-story section w was um, required to be set back at 10 feet. Um, the and the interpretation was uh, 
basically based on the intent of the bylaw that the second story would be set back further than uh, the five foot setback requirement. So the intent is to do a wedding cake look uh, to buildings essentially so that the, you don't have second stories overlooking uh, the neighbors and that's what the intent of the bylaw when it was drafted that way did. And but that's how we interpreted it. If I could ask one more technical follow-up question. Sure. Sure. Um, some of the buildings that have been approved recently have very large overhangs from the second floor from the roof overhanging, making the building seem even like a larger wedding cake that's actually rather top heavy. Um, and I'm concerned that uh, even from the pictures we've seen, that uh, maybe there's been some other approvals. Uh, sorry, I saw a picture over here. I, I, I don't know what the final diagram is going to be like, but in terms of the uh, interpretation, again, and the discretion that the building inspectors have, for approval of the permits, um, is there a restriction to the overhangs? Yeah, uh, overhangs are permitted to encroach into the setback 18 inches on the sides. Uh, otherwise, other they have uh, otherwise, they would have to get a variance for a further encroachment. Have any variance has been asked for given on this particular? Not case? on this one in particular. Uh, yeah. Incredibly hard to believe. So for the, the, the OCB, uh, in terms of your, your meeting, I can imagine there might be some requests for changes to the meeting. But um, Thank you very much. as hard as it is to believe, there is nothing that's come to council in this house, right? So they have to apply, right? And they have to uh, go through a process. And the process is one where it comes to a meeting like this. The neighbors are invited to sit with the proponent. Then if there's a recommendation to proceed with a variance, which Dan would reiterate, it wasn't asked for here. Then it goes to council, and then it goes to the neighbors. 100 meters or 100 feet? 100 feet. People who live within 100 feet of, uh, of the property uh, are notified formally. I mean, anybody can come forward. And then it comes back, and uh, there's, a, uh, there's a hearing then that people are invited to, uh, to speak at. And again, it's a standard process that for all variances, but there's not, uh, there was no variance requested in this particular. So from a read of the, uh, the, the zoning, this is 32% site coverage, including the, 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 uh, the uh, garage. So of the 9,100 square feet, there's 32% site coverage, 25% plus seven. Uh, if, if, if the garage is also at its maximum, I didn't, uh, I didn't check to see if that was, but I, I There's also limits. There's a limits on the size of the garage. Yeah, the hole looks much wider. Um, how long do we have here, Mayor Jensen? Well, we would have liked to have gotten uh, to our agenda earlier, sooner than later. Uh, <laughs> but uh, can we all agree that maybe by eight we can get to the? Uh, uh, okay. Um, as I was out walking with my husband, I went by a, a telephone pole and I saw uh, this picture. And Could you move that microphone a little uh, closer to you, Mr. Walters? I don't know. And I was quite Area. shocked okay. uh, when I looked at the house, and I sensed the um, the alarm in on the poster. And uh, I remember watching this house get uh, torn down, and I do appreciate it was an older house. But I went to uh, look at the, the hole that was dug, and I was pretty shocked. And I went, uh, I live on Windsor Road, Mary Douglas Hunt, and I just care about South Oak Bay. I moved here uh, pretty much for the same reason that I think most people moved here. Our older neighborhood, our leafy streets, and to look at what is going on in South Oak Bay, especially in about the last two and a half to three years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is pretty yeah. shocking. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember when we were when we had our uh, big town hall meeting. Uh, I remember that there were two homes on Monterey, and I just wanted to go and find out what the neighbor felt. And I knocked on her door. Thought there are two. One is slightly more modern than the other. And this lady was uh, probably 82. And I said, tell me, how are you feeling about this? And she said, these people have ruined my life. I cannot stand the stress of this anymore. I am selling my home after, it was many years, 30 some odd years, maybe 40, and I'm moving back to England. 
And as a fellow neighbor, that broke my heart that this woman was put under so much stress from these developers and they absolutely ruined her life and her health. And so she said, look at my fence. The developer had bashed her fence down. A piece of equipment of his was on her property. Her garden at one side was destroyed. And I, as a person, cannot imagine that this can go on for people who've spent years investing their time, their hearts, their money into this community, and we can have this sort of thing going on. And so I went to um, the neighbor, I don't even uh, know, I didn't know Cynthia, and uh, so um, they just shared with me their heartbreak about this situation. And you know, there may be laws and, and this and that, but you know what, we do the right thing. That's what I believe as a community. We do the right thing to care for the people who have raised their children here and having grandchildren come and visit. We do what's right and then we risk the consequences. And that's how I try and live my life. And to see this new friend of mine and to see these, and by the way, we would have had, I'm sorry, we don't have much of a turnout. This has been put together in less than 24 hours and we would have had five times, mm -hmm. 10 times the number of people mm -hmm. who are concerned mm -hmm. about what is going on in South Bay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't want to hear my neighbors who've been here for 30 years saying, we can't take this, the stress of this. We are thinking of putting our home on the market. Mm -hmm. That is wrong. That is morally wrong. Absolutely. So I decided to try and put a group together, uh, not knowing how many would come, because I care about my fellow neighbors. I don't know most of these people, but I care about them. I respect them, and I know we're not all the same. But that people's health is being hurt, and I know that for a fact. Because of these issues and this particular issue, again, it's morally wrong. So um, I won't speak anymore, and I sort of have uh, arranged this, and uh, so there will be a few speakers uh, to share with you, and whatever the Uplands has, and we don't do it because it would then would affect all the other communities in the province, well, that doesn't matter to me in the slightest. We want to do what's right, and it affects every other neighborhood in the province, then so be it. I don't live in every other neighborhood. I live in South Oak Bay. Yeah. So my goal here in coming here, watching the hole get dug into the ground and this thing moving at, at just breakneck speed was, uh, to be very honest with you people, I wanted it stopped. I wanted this developer who has not been apparently very cordial, I wanted this stopped. I wanted discussion before he is allowed to continue. That may be just a horrific idea to counsel, but that doesn't matter. It's the right thing to do. And if, uh, and second, I would like a design committee immediately, not waiting for the community plan, because how many more of these boxes and, <laughs> Bill Carver, I heard about the black house, the structure, I, I can't even imagine it's a house beside him. I walked up there and looked at that, sat in their living room, I don't know Bill very well, and what they look out of their window and see is shocking. So I would like, the second thing, a design committee put together that when someone decides to build a house, it has to be a part of the streetscape. It can't be these ugly sores on the block. <laughs> so if, if uh, please, we could have the, um, uh, how we get this sort of thing passed uh, in the legislature, that's fine, we can do it. We can get many, many signatures. And then I would actually like, again, a design committee approved um, immediately that we can have uh, these developers who aren't, uh, don't have an invested interest in South Oak Bay, they have the interest of making money and destroying people's lives. And that's not who I am all about or my family. 
Um, so if, if we could, if that could be tabled, and I really do think we need minutes. How can we have minutes on this taken? I think it's very important, actually. This is the informal part of the meeting. We can oh. at some point bring this to a more formal meeting, but uh, mm -hmm. given uh, the short notice, uh, that's, this is what we're having. No. Yeah. Okay. And I do thank you very much, Mayor Jensen, for allowing us to come into this room uh, and share with you. Uh, I do thank you very much for that. But my, my requests are on the table, and uh, I would really like to see those addressed for my fellow um, Oak Bay people. And now the uh, a, a homeowner who is very affected Cynthia, you go ahead. Hello, I'm, I'm Cynthia Norton. This is my home. These beautiful trees that the arborist came out and said were viable and healthy, but because of the fact that they would not ask for a variant or remodify their design for the setback off the lane, they would not save. These trees were savable. These trees were home to dozens of beautiful nesting singing birds, an owl that we saw on a regular basis going into the cedar trees. Hummingbirds abound. It's, you know, we, we need to take all of this is our urban landscape. If we don't take care of this and we don't take care of the creatures, who who's going to? We know that there's going to be homes built in Oak Bay, but it breaks our heart to see that they don't have one bit of sympathy for the rest, their surrounding area and their neighbors. We got a notice the night of April 24th in our mailbox, and I mean the night of April 24th, saying that there would be a demolition happening soon, if there were concerns to be in touch with the, with the building. April 25th, that house went down first thing in the morning. The very next day, and right away we were shooting off letters. Before, I knew the house was going down, the house had not been cared for, but we had hoped against hope that it would be something that at least had some concern for the neighborhood. We next they, the next morning the trees went down. The, the note that was put in our mailbox on April the 24th was dated March the 31st. That there's an agenda there. I'm sorry. I I don't understand why we can at least. I'm sure that he didn't want to ask for a variance for the very reason that that would slow down his process and that he would have to speak with neighbors. His agenda was to get in and rape that site and go on with what he's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I look around this room at all these beautiful pictures of beautiful homes in Mako Bay, what, they, what it is and why people pay a premium to live here. I've lived in this home for 30 years. I've raised my family there. I have, I, we, we, are, we are going to move. We are going to start to ready ourselves to move within the next year or two because of what's happening in Oak Bay. And it breaks our heart because this was our dream to live here. We brought this house back from a very sorry state. It had been running for many years. But it's doable. It's doable. And I know that there's preferences for new homes, and that I can appreciate too. But again, I think it needs to be something that has some concern for the community as a whole, and not just the developer who's <coughs> in here, gets his money, and leaves. And I thank you for your time. My name is Bill Trevor. Uh, I live in my third block of Transit Road. Um, my, we have gone through a similar process uh, that these good people are going through with uh, an older home being demoed. Can you speak right into the mic? Sorry. The uh, yes. So we we understand what, what uh, the challenges that, um, that that these folks are facing. I understand also that architecture is very much a matter of taste and each community has its own idea of what is acceptable to be built that will complement the, the community that is existing, that, is, that exists now. Mayor, I understand, Council, I understand how you are hamstrung to some degree legislatively, provincially and, 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 and within, in the other acts that apply. I also understand that the, you are looking at the OCP and I'd really encourage you in any way shape or form to when you're debating the OCP or deciding how you're going to go ahead with the OCP is to look at the, the, the neighborhood that is as it exists now 
And when something is being built, or when someone comes to the community uh, and says, I want to build this, you know, how, how, do, how does the OCP, how can the OCP be implemented in such a manner that there's some consultation with the community? Because when this house was built, when this house was built, the two houses were built beside us, there was very little consultation. The builder applied for a variance. The council turned down the variance. So what the, uh, the builder simply did, they went back and they built exactly what they could, maximizing the, uh, the, the house that could go on those lots. And again, do these two, do these two houses enhance the community at our street and the 500 block of transit? No, it doesn't. And there's not one person that lives on that on transit uh, that, that says this is an enhancement to our community. And there's very, very little consultative process and there's very little legislative process that allows us to deal with, with this, w with the legislation that is there now. And I appreciate the challenge you should face. But as we go forward, um, this is going to continue because all you have to do is look at the, the properties that are being sold. Anything within that has a six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollar price range in Oak Bay, if the lot is huge or if it's in a decent location, it's gone and that house is bulldozed. I'm a runner and there's very few streets I, d I haven't been on. And when you when you you run through the community, it's shocking how it changes. And this is the theme w within Oak Bay now. This is what's being built. And and, and again. Uh, I'm not going to belabor the point, but please, when, when you're dealing with the OCP, deal with what, put in there whatever can be possibly put in there. That if it's something that's being built, that's an enhancement to the community, and there's some dialogue with the community before these things are, are built. And not to go through the... what these people go through, get a notice in your mail that there's going to be a demolition and the next day it happens. And uh, again, um, this has greatly restricted our view. It's, re it's greatly restricted the whole flavor of the community. It's greatly restricted uh, the, the, the flavor of the entire street. And I was door knocking and some of my neighbors were good enough to come to, to this tonight. And, and I think they all feel the same way. But, but, but again, Thank you for your time. And as we go forward, let's go forward you know, with, with a common purpose that what's going on in our community enhances our community and enhances the flavor of what's there now. Because again, I moved to Oak Bay for a reason. I didn't move here uh, uh, to, to live next door to something <coughs> like this. I bought my, my 1923 McClure home because that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. That, and, and that's the, the, the kind of home myself and my family want to live in. And again, that's the, the flavor of Oak Bay is being greatly changed again. Um, and the developers are the ones that are winning. It's not the citizens of Oak Bay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. Windsor Road. So this house, and I talked to the bloke, you know, the chap, the young East Indian chap. He seemed very pleasant. He said, "Oh, it's not going to be very big, only three thousand. Well, I didn't understand that. And then when I saw the pictures of the thing, and not only that, the windows all faced north, looking over my garden, Jerry's garden, Veronica's garden. We all live next door to each other, and it's just." There's going to be no privacy unless we put a bloody great stockade up. I mean, and, and as all these other people have said, I mean, I've never been in the town hall much before, but you get really angry. You, you, come, you come to live here, and nobody expects stockbroker Tudor all over the place, but, you know, we don't want little miserable, little, you know, not moving forward type of things. But this is, this is they're abortions, these things. They're huge, clunky things that are just... They're just not in, um, you know, character with this thing, and, and they're springing up all over the place. Anyway, that's my take on it. I just thought I'd let you know. I saw it at the tea room. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was my wife, Anne. I'm Nick Northeast, uh, 2237 Windsor. Uh, you may have noticed, some of you may have noticed, we have a for sale sign right now on our house, and. Um, 
we're actually not leaving Oak Bay, we're going to McNeil, but that's irrelevant. Uh, we happen to have planned a long time that our house is going on the market when it did, a month ago. And uh, when we knew the other house was coming down, we thought, well, that might be a plus for us because it's going to be a new house and we'll enrich the neighborhood. And then what do we see? Something that will definitely not enrich the neighborhood. We had an open house yesterday and the feedback was, what the hell is that big hole uh, behind us? Uh, from a selfish point of view, I realize you cannot protect sight lines and view lines. Uh, but our house looked right across those back gardens down Monterey, all the back gardens in a row uh, with the trees and so on. And from this design, what's going to happen now is it's just going to be all house with north facing windows uh, and a north facing uh, patio by the looks of the design with a, a picnic bench. Why you'd want to sit on the north side of the house on a picnic bench, I have no idea. Um, but again, we're losing those sight lines, and I'm thinking, you've, you've said that the square footage allowed is the maximum, but you don't talk about the volume of the house. I get the impression that because it's a single story in that section that obviously covers the back lot, it, it to my uh, impression, is a two-story building, even though it isn't. <coughs> And it's kind of cheating on the square footage mm -hmm. coverage mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. internal atrium. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the, the volume should be something that should be looked at yes. in any future guidelines. There is discretion. And uh, the garage looks larger than 473 square feet to me. Uh, it's difficult to tell from a, a computer drawing, but uh, definitely need to look at that. Anyway, I think everything else I could say will only get me angry and reiterate what everyone else has said. So I would let, I'd like some of the other immediate neighbors to have a chance to talk too. Yeah, and these two over here and the right by too. Thank you. I'm Caroline Mitchell and I live directly across the street. Can we yeah. put the, can we put the thing right in front of the speakers so as we can hear? Down a couple of houses, and I'm just in shock myself. This is a picture of the house that's going in, and I'd like to ask all of you if you would like to have this going in next to you on whatever street you live on. And also, I and the lady who spoke earlier, Cynthia, we both live in the same age house is the house that was torn down 1912 arts and craft house now she and i keep our houses up a little bit better than the house that was torn down but our house is by no means perfect and the kind of house people want today there's a very good chance that if we both of us move our houses are going to be gone we live next door to a lady who is 89. We take care of her in her house. She lives alone. My partner here is over there nearly every day taking her shopping and just looking out for her because that's the kind of neighbors we are. But she's not going to go on forever. Her house is a 1912 small two-bedroom, three-bedroom house that she just kept up barely. That's going to be gone. You're going to have four more of these on our street. I mean, when does it end? You're just going to say, well, we can't do anything? Why not? I mean, so if things can be done in other areas, that sheet I printed out, two of those places were in Georgia and the U.S. I know San Francisco, San Diego. The whole of England has these areas. Calgary. You can't ever say, Calgary. we just can't do it, or it's too difficult, so we're not going to bother. So <laughs> <we're not laughs> My name is Veronica Drew, so I live at 1068 Monterey. I now have Cynthia as a neighbor, seeing as the house is gone. Um, for, you, for those of you who would like to look on the website to, at what we're talking about, it is methodbuilt.ca, and you can look on and find out exactly what's going on. Um, I wonder if the letter that we received is normal procedure, if they have to let 
the community know that the house is coming down? Or whether this was just their way of there, trying there to... There has to be some, uh, some certain information given when they're blasting. But <laughs> so they were, legally they did what they were supposed to do? Just. The letter was dated the 31st of March, but it was delivered on the 24th of April, and the house came down the 25th in the morning. We were supposed to give written notice 24 hours in advance. Well, we didn't receive it 24 hours. Absolutely not. What's the penalty? Is there a penalty? For them? I don't know. I don't know that that's And my understanding is the garage is to be at the back. And uh, what is the, is there restrictions about, about always using the lane, therefore, to park? I thought the lane was a fire lane, mm -hmm. you know, bay. I thought all the lanes were to be used as fire lanes, and therefore, are they allowed to use the lane to automatically access their garage and where they will park the car? Yes. yes. They're allowed to use the lane to access the garage, yes. I can't even catch on that one. Um, okay, thank and that, you. And that happens in a lot of the laneways are in fact used, the garages are on the laneway in many uh, areas. So the lane is going to become even more busy. Are they going to want it paved? Um, now it's been called Oak Lane, is that correct? Yeah. Is it going to be christened Oak Lane? Or is it just their name of the house? I, I don't know of any move to christen any of those lanes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mayor, for having <laughs> Uh, I'm Gerald Coleman, and I live at 2245 Windsor Road, uh, between Mrs. Drews and, and the Northeast. And uh, we moved to that house four years ago, did extensive renovations, very expensive renovations, and worked on the garden. And we really love it there, particularly because of the southern exposure, which gives us lots of light in the house. and. Uh, and, uh, and so forth. I don't think I really have anything to add uh, except to encourage the council to move forward with a community plan for South Oak Bay. It, it seems like there's no way to fight through the regulations that have allowed this development to occur, uh, unfortunately, but would encourage the council if, if they're able, uh, w within the municipality of Oak Bay, to, to go, to, to get on with a, a way of, of trying to limit the, the sort of buildings like the one that is proposed for this site. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we all uh, apply liberally the term community of Oak Bay, which implies by its Latin roots, togetherness, concern, consideration. And what is happening now in, in, in Oak Bay? It resembles not community, it's starting to resemble not community, but the jungle. And I hope that our community plan and the ways of this council directing this community will help us to preserve what we deserve to be. Thank you. Uh, Dennis Crabtree, 1041 Monterey. Uh, earlier, someone pointed out all the pictures up on the wall of this room, uh, beautiful heritage houses that represent the illustrious and rich history of Oak Bay. And of course, the houses we build today are the heritage houses of the future. So my simple question to the council is, are these the type of houses that you want to see as the heritage houses that you allow for the future? And when people look back, they will look at this council and say, what the hell were they thinking? <laughs> That's a very interesting question, uh, and uh, not that long ago, I was a couple years ago, I was in Chicago, and it was the 100th anniversary of something called the Robbie House, 
by Frank Lloyd Wright. And it was just uh, when you visit a spectacular house, I wouldn't want to live in there because it's very cold in Chicago and there's single pane windows and very little heat. But what was interesting in the tour, we spent about an hour and a half there and with the guide. Uh, what was interesting was that that house was a pariah when it was built. And, uh, you know, they had letters from the neighbors saying this is the monstrosity, this is terrible. And now I think people accept it as a very uh, unique and interesting design, which is one of its hallmark homes. So I don't know is the answer. I only only a hundred years will tell. Excuse me, and I, I want to be a uh, mayor a long time, but not that long. <laughs> 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 because I, I have an index of my past. He's of last. So we are here on, on facing each other. What sort of? Rob, Rob, Robbie House? Mm -hmm. Yes. No, it's in a very small, very small, it's in an urban like setting, a very small lot. In, in fact, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't comply with our bylaws. <laughs> could, could I, could <laughs> you wouldn't I be able to build it in Oak Bay now. Could but anyways, just, the, the point of the matter is, I, you know, you're, it was a rhetorical question. I know, and I know. That. I just wanted to years, add kind of one quick thing. Sure. When Frank Lloyd Wright designed his homes, he designed them into the landscape. Whether the exactly. buildings were new and modern, which they were, and now we appreciate how falling waters. There's another example of Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm -hmm. It's set into the surroundings. It's not. It doesn't clear cut everything in its path mm -hmm. and start with cement. <laughs> Can, can you explain, if, if, if we were here a year from now, a year today, and the community plan's done, what powers would you have with that community plan in place to prevent this travesty? Would you have any powers? How, how does the community plan overcome this legislative uh, lack of authority that you say you have? The, the community plan can't per se uh, do that. Uh, the zoning can. So one of the things that we could uh, we could do is uh, so we could reduce the footprint that houses can be built on. Uh, they're set at 25. Do we want them at 20? Do we want them at 15? Uh, we could reduce the floor area ratio uh, or the amount of floor space that a lot could take. In this in this zone, it's a hard number. It's a single number, uh, which can be varied. If it was a percentage, it couldn't be varied. We went through, uh, Roy was mentioning uh, some time ago, we, we took off, it used to be 40%, we took that off in this and other zoning to give flexibility, particularly to uh, heritage homes. What we had, uh, what we were discovering is uh, when people had an older home that had been built to the maximum 40%, they couldn't go beyond that and we had no power, because it was a percentage, because it was density, we had no power to grant them, even if we wanted. Good example up on Wilmont, there's three very large <coughs> tall houses which are beyond the 40%. They couldn't expand. And what the fear was, and, and it had happened, uh, people would tear the homes down because they couldn't expand them. So we tried to alleviate that by changing it from a density issue to a, to a single number issue. So for instance, the house up on Wilmont, they could add a, brick, a breakfast nook now uh, with all the neighbors were agreed. So we had hoped that that change uh, would give greater flexibility to people who want to buy an older home and they could add something to it. And uh, I think in some instances, I don't know, Roy, we've gotten quite a number of people who've come forward using that and keeping their homes. Uh, we had one down in St. Pat's, a small cottage which was expanded. And, and before that change in that bylaw, that cottage probably would have been torn down. Uh, so it has had some impact. Uh, but short of us saying, you know, smaller buildings, lower buildings, uh, that's the legal tool that we have. Uh, there is the possibility of, of you heard uh, Roy talking about designated heritage areas. Uh, whether or not, even if this were designated a heritage area, where the, this house would fall within that, those categories, we, I think someone pointed out, it was a tumble down house. It was really a house not worth saving. We, we, do, we do, as a council, get reports on, on proposed demolitions and in the appropriate places we have sent them to uh, the Heritage Commission for advice, uh, but there's a limited amount of tools that uh, we can do, we can use, so uh, short of doing something like that. Now, can we, and 
uh, can we have um, uh, informal advocacy? Uh, that's certainly uh, where we can't force anybody, but we can have, we can encourage people who are developing and, uh, to meet with the neighbors. And we certainly do that. I know, for instance, uh, um, Zebra, is it Zebra Construction? Russ Collins is very good. For instance, he's a developer who builds a lot locally. It's one of the first things he does is he consults with the neighbors and he gets a context. Uh, so when, when we have we builders like that, then we we get a, we get a better product. Uh, can we we can't force them? We can't force all developers to engage the neighbors. We can't force them to engage us, uh, but we can advocate it. Certainly, we can have have it as a as a kind of a, uh, a preferred practice, uh, but we can't force. In other words, if, if we'd had something like that set up now, uh, where uh, we have these uh, you know, contextual committees, or uh, here are. The developer could just say, well, thanks, but I'm going to just go on my own. So we can't force it. Just a last comment. And I, I found your explanation. I understand what you're saying about legal restraints. And, and what I'm hearing, I think, is that the community plan can help us overcome those to some extent. But it seems to me for years as a voter in Oak Bay, I've been under the impression, perhaps a false one, that everyone I was voting for supported maintaining the character of the Oak Bay community. <laughs> I feel like you know something something needs to change. And I hope the community plan is adequate to that, that job. Well I, I think you will see around the table here we do have a, a commitment to, to heritage. Uh, where we uh, we certainly encourage people to come forward and have their homes on the registry. But it's not just heritage, though. No, I mean, that's no, not the, the issue is bigger than that. The issue is replacing every time there's a, a little house that comes on the market, it's knocked to the ground and replaced with a monstrosity. We're we're turning this community into a place where you know uh, there there'll be nowhere for an older couple to live unless they want a place with five bathrooms or seven, <laughs> eight. <laughs> But, but there have been, uh, to be fair, there have been some exceptions where people have taken it upon themselves to to renovate their homes rather than tearing it down. And there, I think there's some excellent examples up and down the streets where yeah. where people have felt the the connection to the neighborhood. And uh, I, I know I renovated my house significantly. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a friend of mine down in St. Pat's who took a very dowdy old house and made it just look like a heritage. Beautiful example. So there are examples of that. And we need to find ways that we can encourage uh, the uh, people to do, continue to do that. So, um, it's developers who don't live in Oak Bay who are causing the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have no connection to our community. And I'm telling you, we will leave. And you, whoever wants to stay here, is going to be left with what the developers are giving you. Is that what you want? I ask you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for agreeing to meet tonight. My name is Jackie Vanderwood. I am a new homeowner at 2260 SMS. Um, I just really want to reiterate what everybody is saying here. And looking around this room at all this beautiful artwork should be something that really sits with you as a council and mayor. And Yes, there are people who do put money into these homes to renovate them and bring them up. My partner and I have done that. We bought the house. We went in and did a beautiful job to the inside of the house and updated it, but never touched the exterior of it. Didn't affect the neighborhood in any way. And those people should be applauded for doing that. Mm -hmm. It is, yes, new developers from Vancouver, from other areas, who have no interest in the community, who have no sense in the tax base, who don't vote for you, who are impacting all of the neighbors. And if it's people who want new homes, then go build a new home in Bear Mountain, or Machosan, or Souk, where you're not going to impact an already established, developed neighborhood that has been around for many, many, many years. And you are a senior citizen component neighborhood. My mother lived in a house that was from 1912 and she lived in it to the day she died in Fairfield. And thank God the people who bought it 
have no plan in doing anything to it. But the house next to her, he gutted it, but he did a beautiful architectural job to it. He didn't tear it down, and that was our biggest concern because it was a run-down, mishandled house. And he did a beautiful job. So I think the council needs to, and I agree with the idea of having a design committee and implementing it to these developers. You need to speak to the community. You need to speak to the neighbors. You need to get a feel and go beyond 100 feet. And don't mm -hmm. go to just one side of the street. It impacts all four corners. It impacts everybody on every side, from parking, from impact of visibility, how it affects people's privacy, everything. And I think you as a council and mayor really, really need to listen to these people as a whole. Thank you. on the time because if we don't get to the official community planning agenda I'm, I'm going to be very brief. so uh, what I'm looking for now is some kind of uh, um, new ideas new uh, new positions I am I'm Esther Patterson I live on Woodlawn Crescent um, I'm not going to get involved with the design aspects of development because of my background I believe strongly in the protection of private property and that is the property you're on, not the property you're looking at all the time. And I think that uh, as a newcomer to this area, I feel very fortunate that I have moved to one of the, the most beautiful areas in Canada that has blessings and it has some problems attached because real estate has gone up and so some of the lovely smaller houses are going to be a challenge in the future. Um, Right now, we have quite a bit of development on our street, so I understand firsthand um, some of the complexities, some of the angst that everyone's going through. There's changes, and changes are not easy. But I would just like to say, I'm not going to touch the, the design aspect, but in the plan, I would like to see a few issues addressed that haven't been spoken about tonight, and that is sustainability, environmental impact and responsibility, and the one thing that I have found uh, living in the midst of a construction zone is that uh, it's it somewhat, I've done construction right across Canada, so I understand a little bit about it. And it's a unique circumstance here where we have not large developers that come in and do total communities in this neighborhood. It's on uh, a house-by-house -house basis. So we have uh, smaller developers, sometimes not that sophisticated, in managing communication strategies. So I would like to see incorporated into that plan uh, by the council some firm commitment to communication strategy so that neighboring houses to redevelopment uh, don't feel that the council is hiding in back rooms, but are coming out front. And, and it may not be like what we want to hear all the time, but n as a group, knowing what's going to happen is probably very, very important and saves a lot of the ill will and, uh, and the angst. Um, and it, you could be a facilitator between the developer and the property owners. <laughs> The street that I'm on, the development will probably be a phase in. This, it started a year ago. I expect it will take three years to complete. That's a long time to not have a communication strategy coming out of the council office. It needs, I, I, I think you can develop a better strategy for management of that. That's all I'm going to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be quick, I have a suggestion too. Um, the last time I was in here, the same thing happened. The politicians and the bureaucrats said there's nothing we can do, these are the rules. Uh, I think um, what we need is a committee to look for ways to fight developers who come in, including legal ways. Uh, bylaws could think of a number of ways in which you could do a bylaw that would give you some some leeway there. Ways in which the official community plan can work to support the community 
rather than allowing these outside developers to, because it's going to happen. That's what the market does. It's going to come happen. So what we have to do is to come up with ways to counter them. And that would be a good committee to have, an interesting one, thinking of ways and, and it would have to involve lawyers and who knows who else, and perhaps even, you know, street protest kind of things. Adam <laughs> boy. But, you know, a group like this coming and spending their time talking and sharing is one thing, but if we don't go out of here with something concrete that we have accomplished, this meeting will just go by the by, and it'll be forgotten about <clears throat> in uh, about a week's time. So I would like to know firmly what steps we can take, what steps you people are prepared um, a board where, or a group where we can uh, encourage strongly developers to go and talk to the neighbors, um, just something. So what concrete can you offer us? I mean, this home, I number one, <clears throat> um, I would like building stopped on this particular house. Uh, the permit has been issued, as I understand. And uh, the law then allows that person to proceed. An occupancy permit. Mm -hmm. Occupancy permit. Couldn't that be held up? Uh, only, only if it doesn't meet the uh, the appropriate uh, health and safety, safety issues. Health and safety issue for an occupancy to be with mm -hmm. I mean, we we do have to uh, <laughs> we have to respect our own bylaws. I mean, uh, uh, we set them up and. Uh, to talk about uh, private property rights before, there, there has to be a balance. So, uh, when people buy uh, properties here, they can go and they can check out in our uh, municipal hall what they're allowed to build and what they're not allowed to build. And uh, we can't change that game part of the way through. I don't, I, not only is it not fair, but it would be illegal. Well, <clears throat> if there is anything that is not uh, exactly proper with this design and developer, then maybe people can examine it with a fine tooth comb. I'm not particularly skilled in that area. So um, um, an advisory board for design for new homes, uh, that was my uh, second issue on the table. Well, that certainly, as I reiterated before, we can't force people to uh, engage in that. What we could look at, and uh, as we go through the official community plan, is whether or not we could set up a, uh, something voluntary. In other words, uh, citizens come forward essentially to assist uh, developers and encourage and advocate on behalf of the community. But at some point, uh, if the developer says, "Sorry, I don't, I don't want to participate in that," there's no way we can't force it. There's just no legal tool to do that. Okay. Um, and the other step, so... We have captured the area of all, have captured the idea of a voluntary design panel. That's something that we can, it can be discussed in the uh, official community plan discussions. Okay. And uh, as far as Obey uh, having some sort of um, <clears throat> uh, situation like the Uplands has, how do we take steps to bring that about? It's very hard, you said, but how? what do we do to, I mean, I just am a possibility thinker and I just believe you try anything. Mm -hmm. um, it, you would have to essentially lever the provincial government. Uh, that lever could be done through the Union of British Columbia Municipalities. Uh, but looking uh, over the years at the number of resolutions that have come out of that organization that have been ignored, it really... Um, I think the chances are zero. Okay. Well, uh, and uh, not zero, maybe one percent. <laughs> no, no, it's uh, it, because uh, because part of the problem is that if they this would have to be a law of general application. In other words, they can't just give it to Oak Bay. It's just out. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I said in '35, they were reluctant to do it, and they certainly wouldn't do it in this day and age. Uh, so they would have to be a law of general application that would apply to Vancouver and Prince George and Prince Rupert. And um, I don't think they're about to give uh, the, um, 
this municipalities that power to infringe on on rights that have been established in private property. So I just I, I'm going with zero. Hmm. Um, all right. Well, if I'm going with one, um, <laughs> we will need to know. I would like to know who I would contact on behalf of my fellow Bay people. And you can start. That's a good question. You can start with uh, our member of uh, the Legislative Assembly, uh, Ida Chong, the Honorable Ida Chong. She is. Uh, what in the old days we used to call uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs. Now it's called uh, Community or a whole bunch of other stuff. But it starts with community community services. So essentially she looks after local governments and all legislation. Pardon? Community sport and cultural development okay, is good. what she is. Well, thank you very so much. So she, uh, it's her department that would change the Local Government Act or change the community charter. Uh, and uh, we could start with her. All right, I appreciate that very much. Um, if I could make sure I have all their email addresses, and that would be awesome. And we appreciate you so much. I just want you to know that. I want, to, I want to thank everyone for, for coming and thank my fellow councillors for uh, 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 listening. And, uh, you know, I think it's fair to say, uh, us around the table, uh, we feel very much like you do in the sense that we live in this community. We want this community to have a special character. Uh, we don't have the legal tool. Uh, what we can look for, as I said before, is some kind of neighborhood-based uh, voluntary uh, buy-in by the developers so they know what the standards are. Uh, and uh, you can be assured this group around the table, if it's, that's possible, we will do it. So thank you very much for coming up tonight. Thank you. Thank you.